The Lord be with you. And also with you. I welcome all of you here to this time of worship with the community of Northminster Presbyterian Church. And as always, are grateful for first time visitors that might be joining us this morning, as well as old friends. Um, we have a couple of wonderful things that we are celebrating in our worship this morning. We are celebrating our newest member, Marsha Foster, a little bit later on in the service. And we will also be celebrating communion together. So if you don't already have it on hand, we invite you to have something that represents the bread and the cup for you to have ready um, for that time in our service a little bit later on this morning. Just a couple of announcements, some of our regular weekly things. We have our lectionary Bible study that meets tomorrow, every Monday at 1230 by Zoom. So we will be um, doing that and reading and discussing the text for next Sunday. Also next Sunday, we have a new adult Sunday school class that is gonna be beginning. Um, next Sunday is kind of a prequel to what is going to be our Lenten study. Suzanne Burgess is leading a study during the season of Lent, looking at a variety of hymns, um, partially based on a devotional that our denomination has made that um, for Lent that looks at, the, at God's shalom in different ways and how we express that in our lives and in our worship and in our communities. And so we're going to be looking at and listening to different hymns and discussing those. But as a way to begin that next Sunday, Suzanne is going to lead us in a discussion about the role of music and singing in our worship, um, how we sing the story of our faith, what it means to sing together, especially in this year when we have not been able to do that in the same ways. Um, it's a particularly timely um, opportunity to talk about those things. So I hope you can join us next Sunday at 945 as we begin those conversations together. A reminder for our families that we are going to have a Bible pickup today for our children and youth from 1.30 to 2.30, um, the church has made available age-appropriate Bibles for all of our children and young people. So if you have a kindergartner age or under, and you already have the um, this one, the Growing in God's Love Storybook Bible, you are good. You don't need to come by the church. Um, but if, your child, if you had that one and your child is now older than kindergarten, or if you have kids older than that, uh, we invite you to come by. We have three different levels of Bibles for our different um, reading and learning levels. 
and want to make sure we get those to everyone. So if you can come by between 1.30 and 2.30 today, Rachel and I will be out right by the front porch of the church to get those to you. Um, please make sure you wear your masks. We will have ours on. And if you can't get those today, let us know. Um, just get in touch with one of us and we will arrange for a way to get that to you. Also for our families, you should have seen, um, I forgot to put it in the email and we'll make sure we send it out and Rachel may put it in the comments in a minute. Um, there are some signups if your family would like to be read one of the Bible stories from our children's story Bible for the time with the children one Sunday, you would just record yourself reading that and share that in the service. Or if you have little ones that want to help with the ringing of the hour, you don't have to have fancy bells or chimes like Jay uses when he rings in the hour. We have had pots and pans and um, bells and all sorts of fun things. So um, there are lots of ways to, and we've had drums. I remember and riding in the beach and jumping and counting. There are lots of ways to begin our worship. So if you have little ones that would like to be part of that, we would love for them to help us with that. Also, a reminder that um, I mentioned the season of Lent coming up soon for our Sunday school classes. Uh, Lent begins on February 17th, and we will mark that with our Ash Wednesday service, which will take place by Zoom with a shared service between our congregation, Pilgrim Congregational Church, and First Congregation, First Congregational Church. Um, and so we are looking forward to offering that as an opportunity to, to worship together. We will share communion, and we will also share in the imposition of ashes. Um, doing that a little bit differently, but um, but we are looking forward to how we can begin this season of Lent together. And I've sent out some information and we'll be sharing more next week about a midweek multi-faith book discussion of A.J. Levine's book, The Bible With and Without Jesus, that we will be sharing um, with a few different congregations and one of the synagogues in our community and um, to bring a Jewish and Christian perspective to how we read the Bible together. And um, we'll also be sharing some information about some weekly evening prayer opportunities during Lent that will be videos that are shared that you can watch at, at your own convenience for just a brief moment to pause and breathe and pray during the season of Lent. And so now let us turn our hearts and our minds to the worship of God. Into God's presence, singing Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Come into God's presence, singing. Come into God's presence, singing Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. God calls us to worship wherever we are. At church, at home, or in the garage. In the bedroom or kitchen. Sitting at a table or reclining on the couch. Wherever we are, we gather to worship. God calls us to worship with whoever is near. Physically distant from others, but joined together in spirit. With family or friends gathered around. Snuggled up with our pets. Alone or with others, we gather for worship. God calls us to worship in whatever ways we choose. Sitting and knitting or walking around. Speaking out or taking notes. Mm -hmm. Singing loudly or with a song in our hearts. In stillness and movement, silence and sound, we gather to worship. God, God calls, calls us, us to worship. worship. And so, and so we, have we have come. come. Let, us, Let worship us worship God, God together. together. Yes. 
Let us pray. Loving God, we rejoice that you have given us a world filled with wonders in which to live and grow, a creation which speaks of your power in the roar of thunder and the surge of waves, and of your gentleness in the whisper of the breeze and the melody of bird song. We rejoice that you too walked the earth as we do in your son Jesus, that he came into the world as we do in the wriggling flesh of a baby that he grew knowing the ups and downs of life and the fellowship of community, that he showed strength through weakness, authority through humility, and service through sacrifice. We rejoice that you refused to give death the final word and breathed life and love and laughter and living into the hearts and souls of disciples who feared they had been abandoned, giving them courage and faith to be your people in a hostile world. As we prepare to share together at your table this day, there is much for which we need forgiveness and much for which we seek it now. May we know now in our hearts that your grace is as unlimited and indiscriminate as our failings and that no one is exempt from your love. May we eat, drink, and share and rejoice together as one family, your family. Amen. And now, as loved and forgiven people, let us share God's grace and Christ's peace with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Now, at this time, I invite everyone, but especially little ones who may be worshiping with us and would like to hear a story from our Storybook Bible that we've been talking about this morning. Um, this is not a particular one about the story we're going to read from Luke in the Bible in a few minutes, but the stories that we're going to hear are about healings and miracles. And so I want to share um, this little part of our Bible that talks about the healings and miracles of Jesus. Sometimes we wonder what is alike and what is different about being a follower of Jesus today. The Bible has a lot of stories about people who were healed or miracles that happened. When you read them, it makes you pause and think. Do these kinds of things still happen today? I love when we can ask questions like that when we read the Bible. All kinds of differently abled people came to Jesus. They wanted to touch him. They wanted his healing presence. Women who were ill, men who couldn't walk, parents who wanted healing for a child who was sick, a man who was blind and wanted to see, they all sought Jesus's healing help. They all came to him believing that with his help, they could be healed. They came with their bodies as they were, and they also came with faith and hope in how Jesus could help them. There were others who were with Jesus when something happened that we can only call a miracle. There was a large and hungry crowd following Jesus, and all that was in sight was a child who had his lunch, and it was enough to feed everyone. Another time, the disciples were in a boat with Jesus when a terrible storm came, and Jesus spoke to the waters, and they were calm again, and so were the terrified disciples. Miracles and healings still happen today, but maybe in ways that are different from the times when Jesus lived. Sometimes sick people are cured, and sometimes they are not. And when they are not, we still know that God's healing is with us. 
People help heal our hurt with love and the loving things they do. When we hear these stories, we remember our faith, our hope, and our prayers for miracles and healing, just like the people Jesus met. Thank you all for listening this morning. Let us pray. Open your good news to us, O God, and open us to your good news, that we may find ourselves in your abundant life. Speak, Lord, and help us to listen. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke in chapter 7, verses 1 through 17. After Jesus had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion there had a slave whom he valued highly and who was ill and close to death. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and heal his slave. When they came to Jesus, they appealed to him earnestly, saying, He is worthy of having you do this for him, for he loves our people, and it is he who built our synagogue for us. And Jesus went with them. But when he was not far off from the house, the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but only speak the word and let my servant be healed. For I also am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him and turned to the crowd that followed him. He said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. Soon afterwards, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. And with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the bier, and the bearer stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us. And God has looked favorably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. So we have the soldier and the widow. We couldn't have two more different people in these set of stories for today. And in these two healing stories that are back-to-back, -back, Luke tells us a lot about the expansive nature of Jesus' reign of righteousness. As we've been following through this gospel, Jesus has called some interesting characters to follow him. He has preached the sermon on the plain, said to love enemies. And then he heals a centurion's servant and then brings the dead back to life. Jesus is crossing every boundary we create to bring healing and wholeness, to end division, and to bring abundant life. And that is indeed good news. But before I get to all that, I have to name a problematic part of this story that I shared with the Bible study group on Monday. Because this is also one of those texts that reminds us that Jesus and the gospel writers were bound to a time and a place. And that included the prejudices and practices of their time. For some, it can be difficult to see Luke's Jesus be completely silent about the issue of enslaving other people. And here we have a slave who seems to be essentially a prop in the story of a Roman centurion's faith and God's expansive reign. If Jesus is so powerful, why not confront the injustice of enslaving another person? Why let his power be silent in the face of the reality of another human being being owned by another person? Why heal someone but not liberate them? Didn't Jesus say that he was called to bring release to the captives? 
Or did this experience with Jesus and this miraculous healing cause a change of heart for the centurion? Did he later liberate this man? I don't have answers to these questions, but I think it's important to name them. Because as much as I wish he would have, Luke's Jesus did not seek to overturn the institution of slavery as it existed in Imperial Rome. And we know how texts like these and some of the writings of Paul gave future American Christians scripture to cite in order to attempt to justify the horrific practice of enslavement of black bodies centuries later. And so I can and should recognize the challenges and problematic legacy of texts like these, and we should always ask those hard questions, while also recognizing that Luke is trying to tell a different story here. And we can still name and appreciate what that story is. Here in these verses, Luke is continuing to make clear to his mostly Gentile audience that Jesus was sent not just to one religious group or only to offer blessings and healing to one nation. The message of these healing stories and everything about Jesus's ministry and preaching up to this point has been demonstrating that Jesus's expansive reign of righteousness will turn the assumptions of the people who followed him then and today upside down. Jesus's reign and expanse of grace and love and healing cannot be limited to one people or one nation or one social status or one faith. You're reminded that God's banquet table of healing, acceptance, and hope would include widows and orphans, women and men with questionable pasts, enemies and victims, oppressed and oppressors, the powerful and the powerless. And such a radical inclusion at such a vast table forces us to think differently about the easy categories that we create and perpetuate still today because we know how divided we continue to be. We seek out our own tribes and our like-minded corners of the world. And if we're not careful, we can be quick to make assumptions about everyone who doesn't sit with us. We can run the risk of ceasing to see those different from us as human, as equally deserving of love and grace. And we've seen where the extremes of this phenomenon spills out into acts of hate and violence. And we have to be vigilant in watching for the ways those small and creeping feelings can emerge in the most well-intentioned of us. Jesus didn't see categories. He saw people. He saw needs. And he acted with compassion. Our text tells us that when Jesus looked at the widow who had lost her son, he had compassion for her. Now, compassion, especially as Luke is using it, is not just to look on with pity, but it is to suffer with, to hurt with. The Greek word here is only used two other times in Luke, one in reference to the Good Samaritan and once to describe the prodigal father's feelings for his son. It has its root in the word for intestines. So it refers to the feeling of that pain for another that is in your gut and how it affects our responses to them and to others. It is powerful and it is visceral and it moves one to action. But we can only feel that kind of compassion when we allow ourselves to truly see another person. Because when we look, we see that we are all longing for healing and wholeness. And that doesn't look the same for everyone. For some, it might look like actual restoration of health from an illness. For others, it might look like being seen and heard and being believed. It might look like finally having justice served. It might look like finding space to be real and safely express grief or anxiety or anger. It might look like receiving forgiveness. It might look like offering forgiveness. And despite the tidiness of so many of our stories in scripture, for most of us, healing is complicated. Healing is hard and healing takes time. When we come to the table, 
to share in communion we share in the reconciliation and healing that we find with God and with one another through the bread of life broken and grace poured out. It is the love and compassion of God known in brokenness that knows no boundaries. And Christ, our healer, invites us to meet him at that table. And there is a reason we come to this table again and again and again, for we are always in need of healing. So we come to this table to join with the whole beautiful mess of God's people, strangers and friends, enemies and loved ones, powerful and powerless, joined across the miles at one table, all longing for love, acceptance, belonging, and peace just like you, and just like me. Amen. This morning, we are glad to welcome Marsha Foster as our newest member of the church who was received by the session at our January meeting. And today, as a church community, we affirm our shared faith and celebrate our commitments to one another. You are a child of God. I am a child of God. Before we could utter the words or begin to understand it, we were named and claimed as God's beloved children. Baptism is a sign and seal of that promise from God. 
It is a sacrament that points to God's great love for us and calls us into relationship with God and with one another. Baptism is a beginning, and we promise to nurture and support those joining the family of faith as they grow and change. Question and doubt, love and serve. You are a child of God as you prepare to enter into covenant with this family of faith. You are invited to recall the promises of your baptism made either by you or on your behalf by others. And just as baptism is a beginning, membership in the church is yet another step in the life of faith. It is not its fulfillment. And today we celebrate the decision to live out one's discipleship through a particular community of faith serving alongside other travelers, seeking to follow the way of Jesus Christ. It is a commitment to rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. It is a promise to be part of something bigger than yourself and to join with others in living out the good news of Jesus Christ in the world. On behalf of the session, we are delighted to celebrate that Marsha Foster joins us as a new member of our family of faith here at Northminster. So Marsha, we are grateful that you and your little one can be with us this morning. And we celebrate that you come to us as a member of the body of Christ into which you were baptized and by which you have been nurtured. We are one with each other, siblings in the family of God. And we rejoice in the gifts that you and so many others bring to us. As we welcome you into the worship and service of this congregation, it is fitting that together we affirm our covenant to one another. Hear these words from scripture that affirm our unity in Christ. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And I know that we cannot sing hymns together in one room yet, um, but as has been a practice in our church for a number of years now, the words of one of my favorite hymns, The Summons, gives voice to our call to live and love as Christ's body. And so I have these questions for you, Marsha, as we celebrate you becoming a member of this family of to answer them. Marcia, trusting in God's gracious mercy, do you turn away from the ways of sin and the powers of the world that defy God's righteousness and love? Do you? I do. And will you turn to Jesus Christ, traveling with us as we seek to be his disciples? Will you? I will. Will you go where you don't know, knowing that you may never be the same? Will you let Christ's love be shown and let Christ's name be known? And will you let your life reflect Christ's life to others? Will you? I will. Will you turn and leave yourself behind to be a disciple, caring for cruel and kind and letting your life be a prayer to others? Will you? I will. Will you let the blinded see, set the prisoners free, Will you bless those who the world rejects and love those who are hard to love? Will you? I will. Will you love the you you hide and let us love you too? Will you seek to let your life be guided by love rather than fear? And will you let your light shine so that your faith might transform the world around you? Will you? I will. And to the, cat, the gathered congregation here today, wherever you may be, as Marcia makes this commitment, I pray that we will join her as we seek to be the church together. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, thank you for calling us to be your people and for joining us to Christ's body, the church. We praise you for leading each of us to this congregation, and particularly today, we give thanks for you leading Marsha and Sullivan to us. Empower each of us by your spirit that we might love one another as Christ loves us, honoring him in all we say and do, offering our lives and service to others through Jesus Christ. Amen. Marsha and Sullivan, welcome home. Welcome to the ministry that we share together here at Northminster. 
We are so glad that you are here. Thank you all for being with us this morning. And now at this time, I invite the gathered community to offer prayers that you may want to offer this morning um, to reflect on the ways in which in gratitude to God, you can give of your time, your energy, your gifts to help serve the ministry and mission of this community in the world. And as we reflect on these ways that we can offer the gifts we have to share and the prayers we have to pray, let us do so now with thanksgiving. Right, we want to take a moment to, to lift up those prayer requests that have been shared before we celebrate communion together and bring those prayers to the table. Um, so a few that are just some updates and ongoing prayers. Um, we do continue to pray for Lonnie's mother, Margie McAllister, as she is now recovering from COVID at a rehab facility and seeking to, to gain strength. And so we want to continue to pray for her. Um, also want to continue praying for Tracy Jackson, who's recovering from surgery that she had last week. And Joe Tanner, and as he's continuing recovery from his hip replacement, and Nancy, as she helps to care for him at home. Also want to be in prayer for Joel's uncle Gary and his wife Connie, who has dementia um, and some hard decisions about helping to, to best care for her. And um, pray for Susan Martin as she's continuing to heal from her broken arm um, and hoping that she will not have to have surgery. Um, and pray that, this, that she is beginning to, to find some healing and comfort. Um, also celebration. Um, I'm delighted to share um, a prayer of praise from Andrea McAllister as she celebrates the five-year anniversary of her sobriety, um, which is extraordinary. And we are so grateful to God for, um, for that gift and celebrate with Andrea at this time. Um, also much joy for the continuation of folks being able to get the COVID vaccine. Um, it never ceases to bring me joy to hear about people getting appointments or being able to share pictures of getting their vaccines. Um, but also mindful of the complications and, and hassles and inequities of having good internet access and um, to be able to make some of those appointments around here and hoping that we will have more vaccines soon that will um, be able to make those available to more people. Um, Jay, are there any others that have been shared in the comments this morning? Oh, you're muted. There are not any that have been shared. Okay, there, um, there may be others that come in. I'm checking my phone one more time. Um, don't have others at the moment, but um, that is not the only way to pray, pray and us sharing them out loud isn't the only way to share prayers. Um, so y'all are welcome to continue sharing those in the comments as we continue to worship together. Um, and so, oh wait, maybe we have one. Just one, said. one just popped in. Okay. Um, yeah, Mariko, uh, her auntie Edith's family, uh, Uncle John died day before yesterday. Okay. Oh, and I just got a text. Um, Rachel has asked to pray for um, the friend Katie and fellow twin mom. She and her husband have COVID and are quarantined with their five young children, um, which is stress on top of stress. So um, certainly. Um, and that's just a good reminder as we've been hearing better news about COVID numbers um, and, and more and more people getting the vaccine, there's still the, the very real concern about people continuing to, 
to be infected um, and to get sick. And so we want to continue to do everything we can to to love our neighbors and care for ourselves and keep one another safe at this time. And so let us gather together these prayers that have been spoken and those that go unspoken as we prepare to share in the feast of healing and hope together. Friends, this is the table. It is not Northminster's table. It is not a Presbyterian table. It is not the table of the church. It may not be a table you can see. It is not a table that looks the same for all of us this day. But it is the table of our host, Jesus Christ, who welcomes all of us and unites us as one. So come, you who have much faith and you who want to have more. You who know what it is to run and to walk and to fly and you who know what it is to stumble. You who feel whole, and you who feel like you are going into pieces. You who long for a better life, for a fairer world, and you who long simply for a place to rest. This table has been prepared for you, and everyone is welcome here. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe. For you have loved the world into being, formed it with a word, enlivened it with your breath, cared for it with your life. We give you thanks for your faithfulness, upholding your promise even when we fail. As you created in love, so you call in love again and again, bringing us together, making us your body. When we lost our way or turned away, still you sought us. Through the voices of your prophets, you showed us your vision and offered us your hand. Though we do not often show it well, we are grateful, O God. We give you thanks for Christ who came to walk among us, living our life and dying our death, teaching and eating and healing, drawing us close to you, feeding us with your word and your presence and showing us the extent of your love. Though we did not recognize you in our midst, our hearts full of our own ways and gods of our own making. You stretched out your arms and gave us your last breath. And then in the shadows of the morning, you broke the last barrier, bringing life yet again into your world, proving love always has the last word. It is still hard to see you, Lord Jesus, in the world today. Love is elusive. Healing seems far off. Peace, an impossible dream. We pray that just as you fed the multitudes, you would once again make your abundance known in our world. Where your children go hungry, break us open like bread. Where your people are thirsty, pour us out in streams of clean water. Where the earth groans, let your dew refresh and your shade protect. You promised flourishing life, abundant, and we beg you to continue your promise, O God. Make your reality seen among us even now. May your Holy Spirit open our eyes and ears, hearts and minds to know you and your call and to serve you with every breath. Give us courage to be makers of peace and doers of justice. Courage to confess our own shortcomings without highlighting the sins of others. Courage to trust your word of hope in a world of fear. God of grain and grape, from our many stalks and vines, we pray that you would create one body as we share one bread and cup, broken and poured for the healing of your world. Lift us into your presence yet again, that we may feast at your heavenly banquet and then send us out, nourished and prepared to build your kingdom here on earth. We pray these and all things in the name of Christ. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus shared a meal with his close friends. And in the meal, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken out of love for the world. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup saying, 
This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes again. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us share in the feast of healing and hope. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we give you thanks for this meal that we have shared from wherever we may be worshiping this day. And trust that your spirit unites us at your one table, your table of healing and of hope and peace and justice. And so we pray as we have shared in this meal that you would equip us to continue to be your body in the world, to love and serve and to be your love, and your grace out wherever we may be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And now that our service has ended, this is when our service truly begins. So may the Christ who walks on wounded feet walk with you on the road. Oh, you're muted, Jay. (laughs) Sorry about that. May Christ use our voices and may (laughs) may Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out your hands to serve. May the Christ who loves with a wounded heart open your hearts to love. May you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet. And may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you. Amen. Amen.